Good evening. Welcome to Monday Night Live. Last week we uh, were telling them, uh, the folks, you know, who we really are in Christ, what it really means to be a child of God, for our souls to be in union with God. We're no longer sinners, we're saints who sin. We're in no longer in Adam, we're in Christ. We've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. His spirit is bearing witness with my spirit. I'm a child of God. All of that is gloriously true. How come I still feel the same way? <laughs> I'm sure you've asked that question or at least wondered about it. If I'm this new creation in Christ and old things have passed away, how come I'm still struggling with the same old issues? Well, there's actually a very good answer to that. I said, uh, when we come into this world, we're born dead in our trespasses and sins. We have neither the presence of God in our life nor the knowledge of God's ways. So we all learn to live our life independent of God. Nah, me. We, yeah, you too. We all did. And we all learned differently, by the way. Different families, different homes, different backgrounds. And then one day, we come to Christ. Born again. Brand new creation in Christ. Transferred out of the kingdom of darkness. Into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. All that is marvelously true, but nobody pushed the clear button up here. Everything that was programmed into my memory is still there. Now do you see why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, no longer be conformed to this world. By the way, let me just stop there for a moment, because we all were. But he's implying you still can be. You can still watch the wrong literature, be, believe the new lies, and everything else. But he says, no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now that's going to take some time. There's no way we can instantly renew our minds. In fact, that is our life pursuit. In a lot of ways, that's the goal for every believer, is, is that our minds would begin to conform more and more to the truth of God's Word, so our lives would conform more, uh, become more and more like Christ ourselves. Now, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, how are those thoughts raised up against the knowledge of God? What are those mental strongholds? Well, uh, it's just things that we have learned throughout our life before we came to Christ. And uh, all these attitudes and the beliefs, the worldview that I've just assimilated from the environment uh, has all been programmed into my mind in primarily two ways. First of all, and primarily through prevailing experiences. The home I was raised in, family I was raised in, the neighborhood, the kids I played with, uh, the schools I went to, the church I went to or didn't go to. All of that shaped my worldview. We all see life from our own perspective. Uh, you didn't have to teach that child in American English. He just assimilated that from the environment. No formal training, but formal training. Before long, he's speaking openly in, uh, in, in a, a language that we'd all understand. And it, it's just a, a natural thing. And, and those kind of attitudes and beliefs are more actually caught than they are taught. They just pick them up. And so if there's racial prejudice in your home, child's probably the same way. They're probably going to discipline their kids later on the same way they're dis disciplined, unless they make a concerted effort to change that. And, uh, but it isn't just through prevailing experiences. It's also through traumatic experiences. Now, they're not burned into my mind over time. They're burned into my mind because of the emotional trauma, the event at the time, like incest or rape or divorce in the home. How many children, for instance, uh, grow up blaming themselves that mom and God, dad got divorced, for instance? Now, here's one of the things that I've learned over the years, which I didn't know years ago, shamefully, sadly, in a lot of ways, because it affected a lot of how I would help people. But people are not in bondage to past traumas. They're in bondage to the lies they believe because of the trauma. That happened because of me. I'm no good. God doesn't love me. My parents don't love me. Whatever else it is. And folks, you can live with those kind of things burned into your mind for the rest of your life and so those things are actually dealt with, faced, and, and uh, recovered. Now, God has made us fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, it, <laughs> when you realize the mystery of the body, it's an, it's an amazing thing. I, you can't help but 
appreciate the medical profession today and, and how we begin to understand how our whole body functions. But in terms of my body being now a temple of God and Christ has taken up residence in my life, um, Scripture says and refers to us as having an outer person and an inner person, an outer man and an inner man. There's a material part of me and an immaterial part of me. And obviously that all works together. It all correlates. And one of the correlations is obvious because that immaterial part of me, that, that soul, uh, has a mind, a will, and an emotion. Now one correlation is just obvious. It's the mind and the brain. You say, what's the difference? Well, the brain is just a part of your physical body. It's meat. When you buy absent from the, when you die and you're absent from the body present with the Lord, your brain will actually return to dust. And you'd be with God, but you wouldn't be there mindless. Why? Because the mind is a part of your soul. Now, what's really interesting about that is in our modern world, we have a very in interesting way to illustrate that. Think of every computer operation. There are two very distinct functioning aspects of any computer operation. One is the hardware and one is the software. Obviously, the brain would correlate to the hardware and the mind to the software. Now, if you just think about that for a moment in terms of the problems that people have, where is the primary focus in Scripture and where is it, say, in science? If you've got a mental or emotional problem, is it a hardware problem or a software problem? Is this a mental issue or is, or is it a brain problem? Now, when you just look at Scripture, almost all of the emphasis is on the mind. Now, can you have a brain problem? Can you have organic brain syndrome, Down syndrome, the Alzheimer's disease? Of course, absolutely, you can have. And uh, somewhere or another, you know, we have to find the, the, you know, the, the answers for our body that would correct that. I thank God for the medical profession and their ability to do it. But you know what's interesting is, is that the medical profession itself is telling the world, and the most minimum, minimum estimate you'll ever hear, is that most of our people are sick for psychosomatic reasons. So they're aware of this, they know it, and frankly, they want the monkey off their back because they, they realize they can't solve all these problems simply from a, from a chemical a balance, imbalance, or a, or a mental disturbance type of a problem. So yes, you can have a, a hardware problem. Of course you can have, and thank God for doctors and medicine that's dealing with that part of our lives. But the real focus to me is upon the mind. You're transformed not by going to a fitness gym, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that's one correlation. Uh, coming off my central nervous system, my brain and my spinal cord, uh, is a peripheral nervous system. Don't make this complex, it's really quite simple. But your peripheral nervous system has two very distinct channels. You have the somatic nervous system. That's what regulates all your muscular skeletal movements. That would correlate then with your will. It's what I have volitional control over. I can move my hand. I can speak like this. It's a choice that I'm making. And uh, that's your somatic nervous system. Then you have your autonomic nervous system. That's what regulates all of your glands. Uh, you don't actually have control over it. That's why they call it the autonomic nervous system. You don't say to your heart, beat, 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 or your adrenal glands, adrenal, adrenal, adrenal. They just do that. And... Uh, now, that's just part of the God-given way that he allows us to function. I personally believe that correlates with the emotion, which in one sense you don't have direct volitional control over either. Think you do? Try it once. I've never liked that person, but from now on, I'm going to like them. <laughs> there's just no way that you can force yourself to do that. Frankly, there's actually no instructions to do that either. You cast your anxieties on your Christ. You put away these things. It, it tells you what to do with it. We're going to get to that later. But uh, you can't directly control your emotions like that. And there's no real instruction to do that. You say, wait a minute. The Bible says I'm to love that person. Love them is one thing. Liking them is something else. I, you know, it sounds superficial, but that's a real true statement, folks. There are a lot of things out there I don't like, but that doesn't mean I can't love them because the love of God is not dependent upon the object. I can love that person even when I don't like them. And then really, that's the commandment God has given to the church, that you know us for our love. And sometimes the love of the unlovely takes the grace of God to do that. And usually, to be honest with you, a lot of maturity on our part. But it is what God has called us to do. Now, think about this for a moment, because 
the way that God has created us. Look at the problem of stress. God created us in a way physically to respond to a certain amount of stress. And that's primarily your adrenal glands. When pressures of life come and you try to respond to it and, and, and cope with it, live up to it, and, and complete your responsibilities in life, your adrenal glands will begin to uh, pump cortisol-like hormones into your bloodstream. That's where we get our fight or flight kind of a response. But if stress persists too long, stress becomes distress and your body breaks down and you physically get sick. I remember several years ago, there was a scale called the Holmes Raw Scale. Um, it was legitimate, folks. What, what, what they did was they realized that, that stress was a contributor to illness. In fact, if you went back when I was young, uh, they looked at stress as a oh, possible cause for cancer or heart disease. Not anymore, folks. They're looking at it as number one and number two, typically. And uh, uh, so... The way that God created us to do that, when, when, when stress persists and we try to adapt to that physically and we just can't. So they created this scale. They said, let's take something that's extremely stressful and just put an artificial number on it, like the death of a spouse or a child or something. Let's put 100 on that or 90 or whatever, or moving, you know, 95 or whatever else. And they had this whole chart full of experiences that you could have. And the theory was at that time, if you had a number of stressful situations that happened that year and it totaled up to 300 or something, you were going to get sick. Now, some truth to that, obviously. But why is it that two people can be subjected to the same degree of stress and one actually rise to the challenge and flourish and the other fall apart? Is it because one has superior adrenal glands? I don't think so. There can be some difference there, and there will be some difference there, but that is not the major explanation. The major difference is, is what's going on right here, what's going on in our minds. We are not altered by our environment. We're altered by how we perceive the environment. Let me illustrate. Take um, David and Goliath, for instance. I mean, it's an incredible story. David was, 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 was young, and he was a shepherd, and... And, uh, and then there comes this giant, you know, scaring the socks off the Philistines. The Philistines are over here, and Israelites are over here, and they don't want a bloodbath. So, hey, why don't we just send our champions out, and they can duke it out and win or take all. The problem is they got a giant, you don't. And uh, so he's out here, he's bellering away and hollering, and they're, they're stressing out here, folks. I mean, they're scared stiff. Who's going to go out and challenge that guy? And along comes David and says, how dare you taunt the armies of the living God? And uh, he picks up his slings on and slays the giant. You say, what in the world is the difference? Well, one saw the giant in relationship to themselves. The other saw the giant in relationship to God. It was how they perceived him. It was how they understood what was taking place. Now, can faith have that kind of a dimension on us? Yes, it can. But you don't instantly acquire that kind of faith. Read the context and you go back and you will read where David had already faced a lion, and, uh, and other animals and bears and, and defended his flock in such a way. So, I, I mean, just like anybody else, his faith had built up to that point. And, uh, but let's put it together for a moment. Why were these people stressed out? Just because of the giant? Is that what stressed them out? No, what happened is their eyes saw the giant. The ears heard the boasting. That information just went to the brain. But it was the mind that interpreted the data. And that's what determined the signal that was sent to the adrenal glands. The brain can't function any other way than how it has been programmed. It's just like your computer when you get it brand new and it's sitting there, but it's got no data in it. Actually, without the program, it's useless. It isn't even a good looking piece of furniture, for that matter. So it's the mind. And, and if you come along and say, okay, I'm gonna change the program, and all of a sudden the screen changes, I said the computer didn't change, the circuitry didn't change. What changed was the mind, was the program. And if you're going to be transformed, what you got to do is change the program. You got to change your mind. Um, let's illustrate that further. Think about this for a moment. Let's take a man that uh, has worked for a company for, say, 30 years. So he's, he's feel, he feels good about it. i got job security, 
But unfortunately, you know, we're in a downturn right now and, and people are laying off and they're laying around, people around him and he's a little concerned. And then Monday he goes to work and there's a little note on his desk from his boss saying, I need to see you Friday morning at 10.30. Can you imagine what that guy would go through that week? Chances are his first thought is, they're going to lay me off. I don't know what it is about us folks. But when people make assumptions, usually they assume the worst, and through presumption comes nothing but strife according to Scripture. And uh, so now he's mad. How can they lay me off? 32 years of service, I've been here, and uh, I've done a good job. They can't come in. He just leaves me a note for crying out loud and come see me on Friday morning, and that's all the consideration I get after all these years. So he's hopping mad. And then the next day, he says to his wife, you know, I'm going to go in there and not give him the satisfaction. I'm going to quit. And his wife slaps him silly, so he doesn't, you know. And then two days, a day or so later, he's saying, well, you know, maybe they're not going to let me off. Yeah, they probably are. No, no, I don't think so. They couldn't let me off. Well, yeah, maybe they are. Now he's back and forth. And you know what he is? He's a double-minded man. One day here, one day there, thinking this, that possibility there. And according to James, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So now he's feeling anxious. Thursday afternoon, he's giving up hope. Oh, they're going to lay me off. Where am I going to get a job at my age? You know, how can I retool now? You know, I mean, now he's depressed. He feels absolutely helpless. He's hopeless. Friday morning comes. He's a basket case emotionally. Finally wanders in the boss's office at 1030, and they say, Congratulations, we just made you vice president. Now how does he feel? He's probably elated. But think about this for a moment. Everything he experienced that week emotionally was just what he thought. Your thought, your emotions are primarily a product of your thought life. When he thought he was going to get laid off unjustly, he was angry. When he wasn't sure about it, he became anxious. He was double-minded. When he was convinced in his own self he was probably going to get laid off, given up all hope, he was depressed. Here's the point, folks. If what you believe does not reflect truth, then what you feel does not reflect reality. When you tell someone you shouldn't feel that way, let me encourage you to take that little statement out of your vocabulary. That's a subtle form of rejection. You shouldn't feel that way. What are they going to do about that? They can't change it. What you really should is just to dig a little bit deeper and find out, I'm not sure you have all the facts, because I think if you did, you wouldn't feel that way. Or I don't think you really understood that situation properly or correctly. And, and how many times that we hear lies and, 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 and uh, slander and, that kind of, and just believe it and become discouraged and defeated and, and, and whatever. And it's all a battle going on for our mind. That's mental strongholds. By the way, let me just point out something. The way that we're raised up, I mean, psychologists have seen this for years, and mostly what this is called is defense mechanisms. And, um, and so we've learned that over the years, the ways to defend ourselves. Uh, if, if you got beat up for telling the truth, you're probably going to learn to tell a lie, for instance. Uh, if you uh, were accused you would, and you thought you could blame somebody else and get away with it, you probably did that. I mean, those are just common stock defense mechanisms. But defense mechanisms are really just flesh patterns. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, that's actually a bigger concept because defense mechanisms just describe, you know, your attempts early on in life to learn to defend yourself. By the way, when you come to Christ, you don't need that anymore. He's your defense. But uh, uh, so we're talking about flesh patterns or mental strongholds. There, there are things that are born into our mind over time. And um, uh, so here we are. Now, I'm this new believer in Christ. I got all this junk from the past. It's, it's like plan B. This is the way I learned to live my life independent of God. Uh, now, here's plan A. All of a sudden, I'm going to church. I hear new truth. I hear about Scripture, what God has to say about me, who I really am, what this world is like, that there's a God of this world, and that there's a true God, and, and I'm in this battle, and, and it's a winnable war. In fact, it's already won because the devil's already been defeated. And I start to learn that wonderful truth, and, uh, and yet... All of a sudden, I'm, I'm tempted over here. And, uh, and plan B wants to raise its head. And, and the, the flesh is kind of still there, and it says, go there. You like that before, it worked for you before, and so back you go to the alcohol, the drugs, the lying, or whatever else it is. 
And uh, so all of us struggle with that. And, 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 and there's no way to get over it because it's always kind of sitting there. There's nobody push the clear button in this computer up here. And uh, so what I try to explain to folks, it's, it's kind of like the more that you learn the truth, the, the other kind of dims away. It's like plan A and plan B are sitting here contesting each other. Jesus referred to that when he said, you nicely set aside the commandments of God to observe your traditions. So any commitment I make to plan B detracts from my commitment to God's way, plan A. In fact, the only thing you can boast in in Scripture is to know God and His ways. And the more I learn to, to know what they are and live that way, the more it works. But let's be honest about it, folks, because truth of the matter is, this is the way I learned to live my life, Now I'm going to learn it a whole different way. There's no instant way to do that. Uh, I'll give you an illustration that was kind of a painful one. Uh, we got a letter at the seminary when I was a prof there uh, from a wife of uh, uh, one of our graduates who was a pastor. She said, I knew I was in trouble when I saw on his, book, on his desk the book Creative Divorce. He was considering Plan B. Can I be honest with you? You got a Plan B and you're considering it, you're probably going to need it. Any effort you make to follow down that line or consider that possibility is probably going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You need to stop that right at the beginning. Temptation always begins with a, a seed thought. I had this little thought, and you got to learn to take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ right then. Because if you don't, you start thinking about it, immediately it's going to attach into your emotion. I, I said, let me illustrate that. I said, here's a guy who struggled, you know, with a lot of experience in the past sexually and, and pornography and whatever else. And he's, he's a good Christian personality. He really wants to overcome this thing. And, and uh, so he leaves the meeting one night and uh, he said, gee, I need to pick up some milk. Now he knows there's this deli over there that sells milk, but it also sells pornography. And here's a nice safe grocery store, grocery store over here. Now as he's thinking about that, folks, he's going to make a choice. We all have a choice when you're tempted. But if he starts thinking and dwelling on that pornography, what it's going to look like, he's going to go to that store. And uh, he's already lost the battle. Chances are, his chances of turning around halfway around, you know, every step <laughs> just diminishes. And, and the interesting part about that is, is that he's already sexually stimulated long before he even sees it, just because of his own thought life. So he walks in the store, looks around, doesn't see anybody he knows, and so he buys the pornography and pays for it, gets the milk, and walks out. And guess what happens? The enemy changes his whole strategy. Up until that time, it's all temptation. Come on, you'll get away with it. Nobody's going to know, and you'll like it. And so you buy it, and you take a look. How do you feel now? You sicko, aren't you ever going to get over this? You throw the thing down. It's like the alcoholic who's got to have that bottle and finally has that bottle and he drains it and then he throws it against the wall and it breaks the glass. And he hates the thing that enslaves him. The devil just changed his role from tempter to accuser. Just like that. And he realized he's been had and then he says, I'm never going to do this again until tomorrow. We want to help you get out of that cycle. So many Christians are in the sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. If that's all you're doing, folks, you're going to do that the rest of your life, even as a believer. It's sin, confess, repent, stand firm, resist, and, and be filled with God's Spirit and move out of here. Now, we're going to get to that later on in this study, but it's so important to realize that. Now, you make that choice, you act upon it, and you continue to act upon it. It takes about six weeks to establish a habit. If that habit persists, You've got, a, you've got a major, full-blown stronghold in your mind. It's a flesh pattern. It's memory traces. It's neural pathways in your brain. It's just the way you've learned before. Uh, you're stressed out, reach for the bottle. You're stressed out, reach for the cigarette. You're stressed out, you know, do this type of thing. It's what you've learned. And it's like a knee-jerk response. I, I like to illustrate it like a, a farmer uh, would drive hay bales down in his pasture to the cattle and and then some big rains came and he kept kind of driving through, but he kept uh, putting big ruts in the road. And uh, it would dry up, but the ruts would be there. And he would drive down this old pickup. And, and after a while, he wouldn't have to steer. That old truck would just follow those ruts. 
And, and that's the way it is for us in our own minds. It's those pathways that we've just gone down before, neural pathways, that they can actually kind of measure now uh, in, in uh, modern medicine. And what pornography puts those pathways in your brain and actually changes your brain structure. And I said, is there any hope for you? Yes, you can come out of this. And I, I want to ensure you that more than anything else. Look at, look at one of the more common, what I would call mental, emotional strongholds, inferiority complex. They weren't born that way. I can almost prove that one to you. I said, go to any nursery or the hospital and say, which one is the cutest? I said, they're all ugly. Excuse me, folks. But if they blew that child up to an adult size, it'd be the old, ugliest home <laughs> person you've ever seen in your life. And take a good look, because when you're about 80 years old, that's how you're going to look. No hair, drooling, and... <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love babies. I really honestly do. They're beautiful because God created them. But, I, but the point of it is they all look alike. And they all have kind of the same potential in so many ways to be the person God created them to be. But at that stage of the game, no hair drooling, you know, whatever else, <laughs> you, you know. But they'll grow up and they'll become these beautiful little children running around your house and, and being a grandparent, I love that myself. But the, so how did we develop that way? I said, how in this world could you not develop some inferiority complex? Somebody's always going to run faster, look better, get a better grade at school, beat you out in a contest. It's always going to happen. In, 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 the, in the average home, for every positive affirming statement a child hears, they hear 10 non-affirming statements. I said, do you want a little tip as a parent? Don't catch your kids doing something wrong. Catch them doing something right and reinforce that. And make sure you do that more often than you do the other. And schools were taught to know better. Seven to one. Seven to one. Now, think about that for a moment. Study went on to find out what it would take to negate the effect of one non-affirming statement. It takes at least four. You don't think that's true? I said, ladies, go out and buy a dress and ask five friends. And four of them say, oh, honey, it's nice. And one says, it's just not you. Which one will you go home and think about? Pastor walks out, everybody says, great message. Another person says, no, I didn't like that. I don't think you're right. Which one do you think you will think about over lunch? <laughs> It's just the way we're built. You wonder how we're doing as well as we are doing. Where do we get a legitimate sense of self? Well, you get it primarily from knowing who you are as a child of God. I, you deeply, the, the, the truth is there. And the love of God, that God loves you unconditionally, whatever else. But in kind of a practical sense, do we get it from talents? You know, surely that talented person over there gets a lot of affirmation. But do we get it from talents? But God has given some one talent, some two talents, some five talents. Come on, God, that's not fair. Only the five talented person can have any legitimate sense of worth. Folks, that is not true. I, I tell you, some of the shallowest people I come across are those that are most talented because they spent all of their life, you know, stroking that affirmation that they get from their talent and never developing their character in other aspects of their life. How about spiritual gifts? Boy, what a spiritual gift you have. Well, when Paul taught about that, he said, I've given more abundant honor to those who are less seemly. Well, thank you, God, that you do, because by and large, we don't. We don't do that. Here's where I believe it truly can come from and should come from, is that if we know who we are as a child of God and we tie into his great goal for my life to be conformed to his image, to become like Jesus, and our life is filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, would you feel good about yourself? You would. You would. Who can have that? Everybody listening right now can, should have that. You can be the person God created you to be. You can conform to his image and his likeness. You can be like Jesus. You can learn to love like that, to be kind, to be patient. And the more you do that, the more the affirmation comes back to you. Uh, I can't overstate that. Let me just tell one that's so prevalent today. Homosexuality. It's a stronghold. I mean, it's so strong that, that basically the secular world has written it off, can't be dealt with. That's not true, folks. It's really, in a sense, a lie. God created us male and female. Your body's telling the truth. It's your soul that got damaged. And that can be repaired. Uh, we're living in a... It's the, 
to me, the most frustrating age I've ever seen in my life, where we're just trying to turn over the tables of everything that has been held true for ever since the creation of humanity. God created us male and female. I could do a DNA, DNA sample of your skin and tell you whether you're male or female. People's souls have been damaged. They've been rejected and criticized. And, uh, and they haven't learned how to deal with it. I've, I get emails from people saying, I got thoughts that I'm homosexual, but I love the opposite sex. Why am I even thinking that? I said, that is a spiritual battle, and we're going to talk about that uh, next week. Uh, folks, let me just be honest with you. This is the battle for every believer, to win this battle for our mind, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to think upon that which is true and, and lovely and right. This is a winnable war. Ephesians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Don't be double-minded about anything, but turn to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And says, finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is beautiful, anything worthy of report, think on those things and then put it into practice. Don't forget the last part of it because just sitting there thinking about it, do the right thing. Do the like, kind thing. Do the loving thing. And, and next thing you know, your life is going to be transformed. And that's, that's the path God has all of us on. Now, let me just close with this. If this is all it is, if my mind has been programmed wrong, I can reprogram it. If I've been trained wrong, can I be retrained? If I bought a lie, can I reject that lie and choose the truth? Of course you can. Of course you can. But... You better check for viruses. And if you don't know this about computer viruses, they are not accidental. They're all intentional. They've been introduced by people who, who uh, cheat their way into your, your program, by disgruntled employees that plans to even make computers do those kind of things. They're intentional. And uh, we're not just up against the world and the flesh. We're up against the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's also a spiritual battle going on for mine, and that's what we're going to talk to you about next Monday night. And I hope you tune in for that. Thank you for coming tonight. Got a couple questions. Yes. <clears throat> One is uh, Stacy is asking about how do you overcome thoughts uh, about OCD, you know, and, and panic attacks? Uh, question is how do you come overcome OCD, obsessive compulsive behavior? It's, um, but it, it almost half answers the question when you actually spell it out like it there, because it's an obsessive thought you are thinking that. Uh, you have a choice. A lot of people don't realize that you have a thought and they just do it. I said, you have a thought, take it captive. Share it with me. I, I do that all the time in counseling and helping people. I said, don't do it, just, just share it. Just bring it out into the light. Uh, the, the compulsive washing of hands or closing doors or going back and forth. Obviously, there's some kind of a thought disorder that is going on here. Uh, in the cases that we deal with, more times than not, just going through our steps to freedom can alleviate that. You've got to know where those thoughts are coming from, and that will probably come up next week as well. Uh, but there's other side effectors, factors of that uh, that can mediate that as people's problems. If somehow or another have been taught a lie years ago that, that people have germs, and if you have germs then you're going to die, and so you spend all your life trying to get rid of the germs by washing your hands. But it's still a lie that you're believing. There's, some, there's a compulsive behavior there, and if you don't get at the lie behind it, you'll never resolve it. And so just keep living the lie is not the way to resolve it, obviously, because after a while, you won't have enough hand cream in the United States to solve your problem. Uh, so somehow or another, we have to get at the bottom of the issue. Behind every false behavior, wrong behavior, frankly, is a lie. And that's why it's truth that sets us free. And we'll cover that a little bit more in detail later, too. The second one is close to it. It's uh, Andrea talks about unfounded anxiety, and it just really paralyzes her life from going out in public in different places and, and wanting to know what she could do to uh, battle that. Uh, we just released this year a brand new book on Put Away All Fears. Uh, anxiety disorders include fear, uh, anxiety, and panic attacks. And she may be talking a little bit more about panic attacks. And uh, we are going to come back to that later. Uh, I've always kind of felt panic attack was really the wrong kind of a term because uh, panic isn't attacking you. Panic is the result. 
And it's a result of something that is going on in our own lives. And somehow we have to get to the basis of that. Uh, one more question here. How should we handle betrayal from our own siblings? After I was betrayed, I try to forget it, but it always resurfaces from time to time. It's very painful. Uh, one of the most painful experiences that people have is, is abandonment, betrayal, and rejection by people. We've all experienced rejected. I, I love what Second Peter 1 says, Second uh, uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 1, I think it is. It says, uh, rejected by man, by choices and presence inside of God. Uh, I, I can't imagine anybody living on this earth that hasn't going to experience some rejection in their life. And it's a painful experience when that happens. And when it happens from your family, it's, it's like a, a double painful thing. People who are really kind of committed to kind of look after you and take care of your needs, and suddenly they reject you. It's painful. Uh, uh, we are actually going to cover that a little bit later on in this series as well. The truth of it is, and, and it sounds superficial, but I do not believe it is. There is one who will never reject you, never abandon you, never leave you alone. And that's your God. That's your loving Father. And, and in this world, you are going to experience rejection, criticism. It's just, it's just going to happen. And, and, and so, rather than try to somehow counter that, find the answer that we have in Christ. Find the answer that there is a God who will never leave me nor forsake me who will never abandon me. He was abandoned, so I wouldn't be abandoned. We're coming up on, on Good Friday, and that was such a powerful statement to say, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken, so we wouldn't be forsaken. That's the message, folks, we have to learn. Thank you for asking these questions. We're going to come back next week and talk to you about that spiritual battle for mine. People all over this world right now are paying attention to deceiving spirits and they're buying the lie. The father of lies is destroying people's lives. So God bless. We'll come back next Monday night and we'll pick it up there. Thanks for following Freedom in Christ Ministries. If you enjoyed watching or listening to this teaching, please follow and share us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 